Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, the federal COVID health emergency is over, but the disease is far from gone, especially among those not fully vaccinated. It's still a public health challenge, but it's at levels that we feel are manageable. At the State House, nurses say they're fed up with proposed staffing ratios and fear it could put patients' lives in jeopardy. Plus, why were dozens of cops fired, demoted, and hundreds more suspended? The Attorney General's latest law enforcement disciplinary report is out. Three, two, one. And Newark is taking treatment for mental health and substance abuse to the streets. We're along for the ride. NJ Spotlight News starts right now. Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this Thursday. I'm Brianna Venosi. Tonight, a COVID-19 milestone for the nation. The federal pandemic health emergency is officially over today. The declaration being lifted by the Biden administration as positive cases, deaths, and hospitalizations have all dramatically declined. That's due to the availability of vaccines, treatments, and widespread exposure to the virus. The order has been in place for 37 months. It took billions in government spending and more than 1 million lives nationwide. At least 36,000 people in New Jersey have died as a result of the virus. Now, Governor Murphy lifted the public health emergency back in March of 2022, so the federal change could mean less for residents here. But New Jersey Health Commissioner Judy Persichelli says it's not time to let your guard down. I sat down with the woman who needs no introduction. Commissioner, it's good to see you. Thanks for giving us some of your time. Let me start with what I think most people want to know. What does the end of a public health emergency mean for New Jersey? Well, at this point, we know that COVID's not going away. So it does not mean that COVID is behind us. It's still a public health challenge but it's at levels that we feel are manageable. So for New Jersey, what it means more than anything is that we want people to remain vigilant, uh, that it is still with us. So how does that monitoring differ or does it differ from how the department typically tracks infectious diseases? Some of the biggest changes are the um, uh, immediate uh, reporting of all hospital admissions um, on a daily basis, seven days a week. We've been doing that for three years at, at this point in time. And because we have seen hospital admissions decreasing substantially, uh, we believe we can go down to a, a weekly cadence uh, in, in, in that regard. I mean, obviously the disease is not going anywhere, as you said, there are still new strains uh, that we're monitoring. So how should the public decipher this what we're still waiting for is to understand the cadence of the disease. We really do believe we're at a, a level uh, where the disease is uh, still present, but not causing uh, the amount of deaths that we saw with the prior surges. So the department will be continuing to work with our local health departments. We'll be continuing to put out alerts if we see any indication of spread in our communities. So just to clarify, you would or would not classify us in an endemic stage? I think uh, most people would say that we're in the beginning st stages of endemicity uh, and uh, we'll be monitoring for surges uh, and the cadence of the disease going forward, uh, which will help us uh, be more predictive in um, future responses. Okay, Commissioner, let me ask you then just quickly about access, what this means for access to testing vaccinations and treatment? Um, so let's start with testing. Uh, at the department, we have enough tests through mid-2024. 
uh, to support our, our needs. We believe we have enough tests, but we will monitor the availability of tests going forward. And we urge everyone to go to the federal government uh, website and order their tests because there are still tests available for that distribution. And what about for vaccinations and will they remain free for now? Uh, right now, the vaccinations will be free. The federal government did purchase enough to continue uh, vaccinating individuals for free. Once it becomes commercialized, our biggest concern is for the underinsured or the uninsured. And HHS has announced a new program, the Bridge Access Program. Uh, it's a public-private partnership, $1.1 billion, to work with pharmacies uh, to provide vaccines for uninsured adults and uh, children that are uninsured will continue, uh, eligible children will continue to get vaccines through the Vaccine for Children's program. So essentially from now until 2024, uh, access to those will be free. How much does it concern you though, that the uptake for you know the bivalent booster is still low and presumably if it's not free or that access changes, it will remain low? We're, I'm really concerned about it. It's, we, we have, I guess, overall, it's about a 20% uptake. And um, it, it, especially for the elderly and immunocompromised uh, individuals, uh, it's, uh, it's an issue because they are getting sick. And in the deaths that we do see, although they're significantly down, the deaths that we do see are, are in that age cohort. Uh, so we will continue our, our public awareness campaigns around that. Yeah, that vulnerable population, of course. Um, Commissioner, thank you again. Brianna, it's always a pleasure. Well, those hailed as heroes during the pandemic today stepped away from the front lines of health care to join the picket line. Nurses protested in Trenton over continued frustrations with working conditions. These were issues that were boiling prior to COVID. Now nurses say they've reached their limit. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was in Trenton and has the story. Safe staffing. Safe staffing. Hundreds of nurses rallied at the state house in Trenton. The RNs called a code red, claiming they're overworked, understaffed, and out of patience with New Jersey health care systems that don't schedule enough nurses per shift. They urged lawmakers to pass a bill setting mandatory minimum staffing requirements, especially in acute care settings like the ICU. Health care is in crisis. HPAE Union President Debbie White says the stressful working conditions not only endanger patients, they make nurses quit, which exacerbates an already critical nursing shortage. There's a revolving door. People come in, they leave. They come in, they leave. We have to make that put them into humane working conditions uh, where they are able to do their jobs properly. It benefits not only them, it benefits all of us. The minute you become a patient, it becomes your problem. Senator Linda Greenstein's co-sponsoring S-304, a bill that would set enforceable nursing staff ratios at different levels, including one nurse for every five patients in medical surgical units, a one nurse to four patient ratio in intermediate and emergency units, and a one to two ratio in the ICU. It makes exceptions for unforeseen emergencies. The bill's modeled on a California law enacted 19 years ago. Studies have shown benefits for patients too. For patients, decreased likelihood of patient death, decreased admissions to critical care, improved patient outcomes, improved patient satisfaction. Nurses and healthcare workers are not machines. Patients are not dollar signs, and it is time for New Jersey to enact enforceable staffing regulations. It has worked in California. I don't see why it can't work in New Jersey. This is... Nurses say they've struggled with staffing crises long before the pandemic. That just made it worse. But polls now show the profession is hemorrhaging nurses. How many more nurses are we willing to lose? Lose because nurses are fed up? The work is too heavy, patients are getting hurt, nurses are getting hurt. What is it gonna take? 
New Jersey's Hospital Association says that while it's incredibly grateful for the dedicated nurses, we also realize the entire workforce needs flexibility to appropriately respond in real time to the needs of their patients. We're focused on identifying ways to expand the pipeline of nurses and other health care professionals. Health care systems have resisted mandatory staffing, saying ratios drive up costs. Unions aren't buying it. Unfortunately, many of the hospitals are putting profit over people, and the quest for increasing profits is getting more and more prioritized within the health care system in New Jersey. The bill would task New Jersey's Department of Health with enforcing new staffing ratios. Nurses have been working to get legislation like this passed for decades. Today, they signed a petition asking Governor Murphy to support the bill and handed it off to his chief executive assistant. In Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, and J Spotlight News. Hundreds of police officers were suspended from the job last year. Dozens more from across the state were fired. Others demoted. The officers' misconduct, 404 in all, is detailed in the state attorney general's latest major discipline report. It's part of a directive from 2021 aimed at promoting public trust and transparency by requiring every law enforcement department in New Jersey to submit to the state an annual report outlining major discipline taken by that agency on its officers. While the State Department of Corrections by far reported the most disciplinary action taken, 173 issued there. Camden County Corrections was second, and among municipalities, Newark issued the highest number of major disciplines. Overall, offenses ranged from drunk driving to tampering with evidence and falsifying records, but also murder, criminal mistreatment of inmates, and racial social media posts. Well, for those experiencing homelessness, life is fraught enough. But in Ocean County, the unhoused have even fewer places to turn. It's one of the few areas in the state that has no full-time homeless shelter or transitional housing. Homeless residents say they're bounced from agency to agency in search of help there. And many prefer the streets over what they say are unsanitary and unsafe conditions at the temporary locations offered. Ted Goldberg reports. I lost my home of 23 years in Beechwood. It's, a, it's quite a long story. It, it's, it's everyone's story. It's, it's happening. I couldn't afford it. I thought the home was paid for. Next thing I know, I'm getting letters from attorneys and trying to get to attorneys with no car. And my house got sold out from underneath me. Jean Daydon has been homeless in Tom's River for three months. Ocean County doesn't have a full-time shelter for people experiencing homelessness, so she's been put up in a motel. Not clean, there's bugs. You can't cook. You're eating sandwiches, you're spending money on uh, food. To sit. It's just hard, it's hard all, I can't even say it, it's just hard. Motels may not be a long-term solution, as more of them around the county are demolished and replaced with higher-end homes. Some of the county's homeless have resorted to living in the woods, subject to the elements, fires, and problems finding food. They want to send me further away from my husband. It, and he sleeps in the woods or at his aunt's. It, it, we can't do it. it, it I, we lost everything. Now our family unit that we had is being ripped apart. And I don't know what's gonna happen with that now. It's scary, honey. Ocean County has affordable housing, but the wait lists can run for years. The county is getting a small boost from the American Rescue Plan, which could solve a small part of the problem. We're not going to end homelessness if we're just putting people on the waiting list. So we're, you know, really trying to get creative and trying to find units in the community where private landlords are willing to work with us and understand that we're going to be providing a lot of supports to the people who are placed in those apartments. Thaisa Kelly is the consulting director for the Ending Homelessness Group a nonprofit that was awarded a two-year, $3 million grant given to Ocean County. She says some of that money will go towards rent assistance for people who could become homeless, and some money will help find housing for people who've stopped by Code Blue shelters over the winter. What we're really hoping with this is that we've got a huge infusion of resources for rental assistance and that we can use some of that money to help end that cycle for many of the people that we were seeing in Code Blue. Groups around Tom's River are divided on how they feel about a homelessness trust fund. On Wednesday, 
Ocean County Commissioner Gary Quinn said the county is expected to start one as soon as June. Under a state law, municipalities can add a $3 to $5 charge to documents filed in county clerk's offices, and that money can be used to help put people in homes. Adding more money is not the issue. It's building a building and having a nonprofit organization like ourselves run it. Um, you know, obviously I'm biased because, you know, we've been doing it for six years. The lack of having a, f a physical building to work out of is, is, the, is the problem that we mostly, I feel, is the biggest obstacle. Does it generate enough money, believe it or not, in the long run to solve the problem? No, it doesn't. But does it help uh, create a launching pad and a, and a source of funding that then doesn't have to come from somewhere else? Well, yeah. And the nice thing about it is it's dedicated. I'm not asking for financial. I'm not, uh, just help me, help me. Let me get in the little house. Let me be able to have my coffee and <laughs> just be a person again, put food in the refrigerator. Homey touches that are hard to come by when you live in a motel. In Ocean County, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. New Jersey, like elsewhere in the country, is in the midst of an ongoing teacher shortage. Well, this morning, lawmakers considered a new package of bills aimed at addressing the issue and breaking down the employment barriers they say are preventing potential educators from entering the profession. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas has the story. This is not just an approaching crisis. This is a crisis that is here, a crisis that will take years to resolve completely, but at least now with these bills, we are on the path. That crisis being a teacher shortage that's affecting nearly every school district in New Jersey. Educators and experts turned out in overwhelming support for a package of bills that cleared the Assembly Education Committee today aimed at reversing that shortage. The bills that we're introducing here today will seek to address individual issues by removing barriers, addressing costs, and adding resources. Assembly Education Committee Chair Pamela Lampett explained that many of the bills came from recommendations offered by a task force recently convened by Governor Murphy to attract and keep more teachers in the classroom. Number one barrier is the cost of education. So we're removing some of the restrictions on the transfer of credits for students and establishing a tuition remission program for student educators. And when we look at the high cost of student teaching, our student teachers, you know, go off to, to the, their, the classrooms and, uh, and they don't get paid um, and they still have to pay tuition. So it's another issue that we need to continue to address. Some testifying in support of a new teacher certification reimbursement fund saying it can cost up to $4,000 to get certified and some end up paying more when they have to retake the test, which happens all too often. Over and over, we hear that people are struggling to pass the Praxis Core Academic Skills Exam. Most struggle with the math section, which includes questions related to statistics and other advanced math concepts. Many of these individuals are seeking elementary school certification and cannot understand why they need to pass an exam with middle to high school level math concepts. One bill would change the requirements around passing that exam. Another bill would allow teachers who've already retired to come back to the classroom for two years without affecting their pensions. Yet another would allow tax write-offs for the expense of classroom supplies teachers make on their own. That one raised some concern of who might not be included. We don't believe that the definition right now of educator or paraprofessional would include those related services providers that um, speech language specialists are. So um, hopeful that that we could see an amendment to the definition there. Others asked for broader efforts to attract and retain education professionals beyond classroom teachers. This bill package is largely focused on teachers, but there are many other um, positions within our schools, school counselors and other roles that we hope we'll start looking at as well. A similar concern raised over a bill introduced by Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin that would increase education time for students. Students can't fully learn until they're whole, so you can throw remediation and tutoring at them all you want, but if we don't focus on that social emotional piece in concert with the learning piece, um, it doesn't work well. This package of bills now moves to the full assembly for a vote, and this committee is hopeful these bills can be signed into law before the end of the legislative session in just a few weeks. In Trenton, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. In our spotlight on business, several Atlantic City casino hotels are being hit with a lawsuit accused of taking part in a scheme to artificially inflate room rates. 
The class action suit filed by Consumers Tuesday names Hard Rock International, Caesars Entertainment, which also operates Harrah's and Bally's, and MGM Resorts, which operates the Borgata, accusing the hotels of charging 25 percent more for rooms in 2022 than in 2019. That's despite renting about 5 percent fewer rooms overall. It's a violation of the U.S. antitrust law, according to the lawsuit. Consumers allege the hotels used the online platform Sendin, which is also named in the suit, to calculate prices, but didn't use required market factors like increased demand to determine rental costs. They also allege that they were misrepresented to guests about how room rates were set. Turning now to Wall Street, here's a look at today's closing trading numbers. And make sure you check out NJ Business Beat this weekend. Raven Santana anchors and highlights the state's youngest entrepreneurs, including a 14-year-old fashion designer and a Newark organization that teaches students business through hands-on art. That's Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. It's high praise for Newark this week. The city is being recognized by former President Barack Obama as a national model for violence reduction. It's one of just four cities nationwide to be designated as a My Brother's Keeper model community. The program was created by President Obama in 2014. It was in the wake of the fatal shooting of black teenager Trayvon Martin in Florida. It challenged every community in the nation to come up with new strategies to reduce violence, in part by focusing on supports for boys and young men of color. While Newark hit the mark, Mayor Ross Baraka's administration points to the combination of data-driven policing and community-based anti-violence programs among the reasons for its success. Newark is also working to combat the rise of drug-related deaths. The city's been hit hard by the opioid epidemic, today rolling out a new harm reduction program focused on treating the person as a whole and meeting residents where they're at. Melissa Rose Cooper has the story. And with a snip of these scissors, the city of Newark welcomed a new initiative to treat substance use disorders and mental health. Just another testament of how really Newark is setting the tone, really moving forward and doing the things that many places around are not doing. This mobile community care vehicle is the latest effort from Integrity House, one of the largest providers of addiction treatment in the state. Staff will offer a variety of services, including health screenings and harm reduction assistance, all aimed at improving quality of life. The recent surge in pro problematic substance use and drug-related deaths across the state has shown us the traditional way of doing things simply isn't good enough. We've realized that far too many people experience unique challenges that make it difficult for them to obtain help in, inside the traditional brick and mortar facilities. According to the state attorney general's office, there were 668 suspected drug-related deaths statewide between January 1st and the end of March, with the most being in Essex County. Last year, there were nearly 2,900 deaths in the state suspected to be drug-related. We realized that some of the biggest problems that we have with people not being able to get employment is drug issues. Um, is addiction, right? And as a child who grew up in a home of addiction, I am sure that if my mother was here today and she was standing before you, she would say to you that she would have loved to see a mobile vehicle into the communities that probably could have got her out of that addiction earlier in her life, right? To give her integrity back right, to be the woman that she is today. Supporters of the mobile vehicle say it will help provide necessary services to people in the areas where it's needed the most. The disease of addiction is a brain disorder um, and it alters a part of the an area of the brain that is necessary for social functions and life-sustaining functions as well and social interactions. And so the reason why this van is important is that you're bringing services to individuals, particularly those who are experiencing homelessness, um, and that you're bringing them life-saving medication, you're connecting them to services and supports, and in, in essence what you're doing is not only saving lives, 
but you're changing lives through this service. We know that meeting people where they are is best practice. We know that there are many barriers to treatment, um, lack of access to transportation and consistent housing, uh, um, and general stigma. And so bringing care directly to people where they need it is going to help meet our goal of improving access, improving equity, and leading to better treatment and recovery outcomes here in New Jersey. Integrity House plans to use data from the city as well as feedback from the community to map out the best areas the mobile van will service. Staff say they hope what they're doing in Newark will help inspire other cities across the nation as they battle addiction too. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. And that's going to do it for us tonight. And a reminder, you can now listen to NJ Spotlight News anytime via podcast. So make sure you download it and check us out. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you here tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com.